This is Coolcast for November 17th, 2011, a somewhat weekly gathering discussing all sorts of aspects of collaborative open online learning. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by the Change 11 Week 10 facilitator, Eric Duval, uh, who's focusing on learning in a time of abundance. Uh, we've got a crew joined us so far, some people in the chat room. Why don't we quickly go around and say who we are? Uh, and then we'll jump into things. This is, again, Jeff Lebo in Pusan, Korea. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm at Brock University in St. Catharines, Ontario. Hello, and I'm Carol Yeager, and I'm with SUNY Empire State College and uh, running a, an, an, an other MOOC <laughs> at the moment. And Hi, I'm Eric Duval. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Leuven in Belgium, uh, which means that probably I'm the only one for whom this is a convenient time. So uh, thanks for all, to all of you. For that. And Brenda, if you want to unmute, you can say a quick hello. Hi, yes, I'm Brenda Callback. I'm from North Salem, New York. I work uh, with knowledge in the public interest, and I'm a doctoral student at Fielding Graduate University in California. Excellent. We also have VHAU student. Would you like to say hello? Hello, I'm uh, Valerie and I'm an Athabasca University student and completing my master's right now in distance education. I Valerie, you did a, a remix of the, the rhizome. I loved it. I'm glad, to, glad to meet you. Thank you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, and Athabasca students always, I feel like, deserve a certain badge or something in the world of openness. They. Uh, are held in high esteem. Uh, speaking of being held in high esteem, Eric, uh, you mentioned you're a professor of computer science. How did a professor of computer science become Mr. kind of open content and mooky kind of guy? Ooh, I thought you were going to start with an easy question. Um, <laughs> I have no idea anymore. Um, I, I do remember that uh, many, many years ago now, I'm an old man, um, uh, my first project uh, when I started working here uh, was on uh, reusing, um, at the time still, analog video materials stored on large analog video discs. I'm spreading out my hands, but then they're not no longer on the camera, so it's like a huge uh, uh, disc. Um, and we were doing that in a medical context, and the idea was basically if we have all these nice video clips that illustrate certain medical procedures, we can reuse them across uh, Europe because we have European funding. Uh, and so that was my, my first project. And of course, then you very quickly run into the problem of, uh, well, if, all, if many of these resources are protected in some way or another, you have to pay for them, which is one thing. But uh, more annoyingly, um, you have to go through a complex procedure to secure the rights. Um, that's a really big barrier. Um, and so I think that's probably, I'm not completely sure, but that's probably one of the reasons why I became more interested in open resources, um, because then you don't have to worry too much about, can I really use this and whom should I ask? And if I then give it to another audience than I originally intended it for, do I have to renegotiate and all of that? All those problems go away. And then we started doing more stuff with, you know, what you would call nowadays open educational resources. Uh, at the time started the, the Ariadne Foundation that is still uh, working on that topic. Um, but I guess after a year or two, three, I also started to realize um, open resources is one thing, but it's, you know, if we use them to then do more or less conventional stuff in conventional settings, maybe we're not really doing what is important. Um, and so I think that started me and a number of other people as well to get into experimenting with different ways to teach and I now put it between quotes because I'm not completely sure what it means to be a teacher um, or at least the conventional sort of connotations are not necessarily what I'm terribly interested in anymore um, and so that led us to do more of the open work and how that led to you know, becoming an open guru, I don't know, that's not in my control. Uh, and that was never the intent, I think. I, I frankly really don't like the idea of gurus or, what do they say in the US? I think taught leaders, which to me sounds like a contradiction in terms, because uh, how can you lead 
All right, well, we'll, we'll call you an OER dude. Okay, that's much better. The uh, dude, yeah. That's... <laughs> and I've been an OER guy for, for a while. Have you participated in MOOCs much prior to this one? No, not very much. I have been a, a lurker on uh, one of the earlier ones. I forget which one, about half a year ago. Um, didn't really actively participate all that much. I must also admit that for me, the I think you have similar issues, if I'm not mistaken, with the label MOOC, right? But maybe um, about a different part. I'm not sure. For me, it's the C part. Uh, I think you have more issue with the M part. But I'm not sure what course means necessarily when you talk about a networked experience where people exchange ideas and, and thoughts and, and so on, um, then, you know, my life is kind of a MOOC, I guess. That's true. My favorite part is the ooh, the open and online you part. And the, the massive and course is open to uh, interpretation. Uh, so I want to open things up for, for people to chime in, but uh, I just want to ask, how's your week been? And is that a question to me or to, yes, to everybody? Yes, to you. Uh, as the facilitator of week 10, uh, exciting, challenging, frustrating, how's it going? No, it's a, it's a bit less massive, if you want, uh, than I had expected it to be. Um, I sometimes, but I think that's kind of okay, I sometimes wonder, maybe I'm missing a whole part of the MOOC universe because it's not, you know, either on Twitter or Facebook or in the daily newsletter and there's these thousands of people conversing about openness and abundance and I just don't know about it. Um, but if that is not the case, maybe the case, um, if that is not the case and I think it's uh, a little bit less intense than I had uh, worried it would be, so that's kind of reassuring as well. All right, well I want to open things up. Anyone who has uh, questions, comments or thoughts to share about week 10 or anything else related to Collaborative Open Online Learning, jump in. I guess I'll jump in right away because uh, I want to agree with the whole course versus experience thing. It seems to be a, a theme that's going on, and I agree totally. It seems more like it's an experience. And I like it because experience is a good teacher, right? So we can learn a lot from experience. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask, um, AC ACM seems to guide our computer science department here at Brock University uh, with everything with <laughs> their knowledge units and they seem a lot really focused on on content uh, and OERs are often focused on content as well but when I was listening to you talk and and read what you wrote Eric you were saying that um, you know you're, you're referring to Moore's law and I was thinking that's more about process right and and solving and analyzing so how do we move away from just all this content and more on the process. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that uh, you want to move away or that I want to move away from content. Um, I do, I, I want to have the content part there, but the content part is only one thing. Um, I think it's a little bit, you know, how did uh, uh, David Wiley once uh, explain it? Like, you know, if it was only about content, then in the old days we would have put uh, kids into libraries and ask them to come out after five years to grant them a diploma or something. So even then it was not just about um, content and, and, and the same is true now. Um, I, I think it's probably true that content has been a little bit overemphasized, but I'll plead uh, guilty um, on, on that front um, because I think, at least in hindsight, but I think actually even at the time we were a bit uh, consciously deciding to focus on content first because the idea was that content is relatively easy to share and has relatively obvious advantages. It still took 10 years longer than I had imagined it would. Um, I thought it would take like you know, six weeks or so and then this whole OER thing would be done and we could move on. Um, really? A bit longer. You thought it would be done? Um, what did you think would come after? Well, I, I, I had the idea that this was such a no-brainer and so obvious. You know, let's all just share our material, right? And, oh, yeah, well, how do we do that? Okay, so we need to coordinate a little bit and maybe set up a few things. But we didn't have to invent anything, really. Uh, we just had to coordinate a little bit and, and make sure that things interconnect. So why hasn't uh, that happened? Well, it has happened to a certain uh, degree, I would, I would say. Um, the, the, you know... Um, certainly, I know many more people now that uh, use OERs or that uh, output OERs 
uh, than ever before. And it's certainly not something that I feel I need to do as much evangelizing around as I, as I used to. Uh, but maybe your experience is different. I might live in a non, how do you say, non-representative part of the world. Like. So what I hear you're saying is that you've helped contribute to this abundance of content. Yep. And I also, <laughs> I mean, there's a version of my uh, reasoning where I would almost say that it's great that we've now um, created such abundance of content that we can have a conversation about something else. You know, there's a moment where scarcity disappears and what used to be the problem, but just to frame this, because I'm not sure that I'm explaining it very well. 20 years ago, when I would walk into a classroom, as I still do from time to time, and I did a bit more often then, and I would uh, try to explain something, and I would want to use a video uh, tape. It, you know, some of you will remember these times, maybe. I had to make a request probably six weeks in advance. I remember writing a letter to the national television uh, broadcaster and then getting a weird kind of formatted tape, like these big tapes, bigger than VHS at the time, and that would come in a brown envelope like two weeks later. Then I had to go to the audiovisual service. They had to transform it into some other carrier. And then when I presented it in the auditorium, there was a technical person there who would come specifically for my class and put it in a machine and connect cables beforehand. And then at the time when I wanted to show it, I would say like, launch the video now. And then he would show like 90 seconds and I would continue. He would take everything with him and, and leave again. Now I just, at the, the, you know, at the moment when I want to show it sometimes or sometimes a little bit earlier, I go either on YouTube or into the Ariadne repository, do a few searches, find what I want and, and show it at that moment. So that whole way of interacting with content and the availability of that content, again, the abundance of that content is such a different, you know, experience nowadays um, that I can focus much more on, okay, so if I can have any video I want at any moment, what do I really want to do with that? And all the time that used to go into just getting the material, I can now spend into thinking about, um, you know, what are meaningful activities around that. It's, I'm, I'm being kind of selfish on this because I actually did try and uh, we were doing a curriculum review with the computer science department and everything we have in Ontario, there's six areas and they're not just all content. Content is only one of the areas. The other areas are uh, awareness of limits of knowledge, autonomy and professional capacity. So knowing your limits of, of what you don't know, and we're not just talking about content, we're talking about process as well. So um, And they really pushed back on that. So I was hoping you could give me uh, <laughs> your thoughts on that. Yeah, that, I think that the limits of, of your knowledge are, are a really good part. That's also one of the reasons why I talk about, um, especially to computer science students, why I talk a lot about uh, Moore's Law in, in one of my first lectures typically. It's just to explain, look, you know, whatever I'm going to do with you, most of, you know, you know by the time you get your degree or five years later, most of that is relevant to you then and doesn't exist yet now. So I can't teach you anything about that because I don't know what that will be uh, and if I did I you know I could probably retire and buy a few islands by now um, and and so you know I need to help you figure out how to deal with stuff that I don't know you don't know yet to solve problems we don't know yet and therefore just doing content transfer even if that was an option is not a very attractive one Maybe I'll throw this back out to the rest of the group. I was just wondering if other people had found examples, because that was one of your challenges, was to find ways that people were leveraging all this um, abundance of information to, to solve these problems with using tools that we didn't know existed. Yeah, that was one of my uh, questions as well. I want to say a quick hello to Vance, who has joined us. Hello, Vance. Hi. Uh, just unmuting my mic there very quickly and seamlessly. Um, I, I think um, Jeff and I in our own separate worlds have been sharing content for quite a long time. I, I kind of feel it's second nature and I, I'm sure Jeff does too. Um, we do it in our own ways. Uh, so I, I, um, I've suggested that we've been mooking for a long time, long before 2008. But anyway, it's, uh, it's great to be here. and. Um, I'm not actually planning to come to the live session later because to me this is the MOOC. I really like this. So anyway, hi to everybody.
And, and I, I think I wanted to hear um, uh, what kind of response you've gotten to your challenge. Um, I also wanted to ask you, uh, Eric, you know, in your post, you talked about information overload or, or filter failure. And it's something I think, you know, the the production side of the content is is happening quite well. I think it's the filtering that's the challenge. And it's on a couple of overlapping levels. Personally, we deal with the fact that our social life has expanded and we're talking to college dorm mates that we never would have been in touch with before and people from all our history of social circles all at once. And we're managing that personally and filtering that. And professionally, for our professional development and for developing courses, we've got the fire hose and we have to filter that and find what's useful. I'm really curious what tools you use specifically. What do you use to to look at your your reader or your Twitter stream or what's your the, the tools and the strategies you have for sipping from the fire hose? This is the moment where I wish I had something really smart and unexpected to say like oh we've developed this tool and it solves all <laughs> the problems and just go to this URL it's all open source and you know that'll be my claim to fame for, for eternity. Uh, I don't. Um, so, so what do I do? I, I do. I, I am a man of very simple. I am a very simple person, and so I have very simple principles. So one of the things I do that helps me with uh, the filtering and and you know containing the different aspects of my life is I sometimes I'm a very how would I say very um, strict uh, keeper of my time. So I will things like uh, like, like today I, we have this other session hereafter. And if you try to get in touch with me in an hour and 45 minutes, well, one minute later, I will not be available because I have blocked that time for my kids and me until they go to sleep. Final stop. So it's a very simple proposition. I go to my kids and my laptop closes and my I don't respond to my mobile. I don't do anything but face-to-face -face interaction with them. And that kind, you know, those are very simple. And I do that a lot, often, by the way, in the morning because then at least I have that blocked out and nothing interferes with that. Um, and so that's one thing. But the second thing is I do something very similar with uh, groups of students, okay? So I just block in my agenda periods where I'm not doing face-to-face -face work with them, but where I'll say, like, I think tomorrow, if I'm not mistaken, between 9 and 11 in the morning after my kids are at school, I'm, again, not available for email, chat, or anything because I'll be working asynchronously with uh, my students in my multimedia class. and so. I try to make that correspond a little bit to those blocks of time that I reserve for specific people. I try to make that correspond roughly with my priorities in life, if you want, okay? And so that's uh, another thing. Apart from that, at the moment, but hey, this will, I hope, be different in two years from now, or so it definitely was different two years ago. At the moment, I do a lot of uh, Twitter stuff because that sort of works very well for me to get me to, you know, to point me to stuff. I do a lot of, you know, I'll follow a certain hashtag for a few days until I find it no longer gives me a lot of value and then I abandon it. Um, I had to get used to, as I think many people do, to the nature of dipping in and getting out of streams of activities of people. Uh, we have a little bit, um, actually I should say that, uh, we have a little bit of tools that we uh, develop and use in uh, the work we do in the lab here. For instance, we have a sort of uh, sharing your reading habits in terms of scientific papers within the team, a tool we call a tiny arm, or this is not yet another reference manager, um, which is also, by the way, at the moment, uh, a candidate in a, in a sort of contest that um, the Mendeley people are running. Um, so, you know, I use some of the tools to try and filter. Uh, maybe the, the fine and, and yes, I still do quite a bit of RSS reading and also email as well. Um, do you use a Twitter? Do you use a TweetDeck or a Hootsuite or a Google Reader? Or I'm just curious. Um, what all you're... of the above except uh, Hootsuite. So what I do is I use TweetDeck to follow certain hashtags, but I also regularly use the uh, just the Twitter client. Uh, the, the I'm doing Mac, so the just the the default Twitter client, which I like for just getting the stream. Um, you know, when you're not doing something based on hashtags. Uh, and maybe the new um, boxer brief question is, uh, are you Android or iPhone? <laughs> I'm kind of both, actually, <laughs> uh, because I have also my students develop for both and also HTML5, uh, which again, 
can be deployed to both. Which do you use more if often? I can choose the iPhone. I'll... Okay. <laughs> uh, want to say hello to Jose, who's joined us. Hello, Jose. Hello. Uh, hi, Eric. Always nice to listen to you. Where are you coming from, Jose? Uh, from Portugal, Lisbon. I'm, I'm with Universidade de Bert, which is the open uh, this is education university in Portugal. Excellent. Uh, the question on the floor was to discuss one of the challenges that Eric put out there, but I want to see if anyone else had any comments or questions to chime in with before we ask Eric to tackle that. My brief so. comment just... Sorry, sorry. Go on. I was just going to say I, I really like to listen Eric talking about how you need to how you need to manage the time you are online and the time you are available and that capacity of, of having the discipline to block certain times which are important for your personal life like for your kids for your family or for other um, subjects that you feel like uh, you do not have to be connected all the time 24 hours a day you need to make time for yourself and for the private things in your life and I really uh, enjoyed listening to him saying about how he manages that. Eric, as a self-proclaimed old guy, do you have any concerns about the new generation that's growing up in this uh, time of abundance having those priorities? Do you see the young generation taking time to smell the flowers and play with the kids? No, but then neither did we, or at least did I as a young person, right? I, I remember this, oh, we, I had that argument at least once a week with my parents. I think it's kind of the, the, the alternate version of what you have now, uh, that, I, that I, uh, I read too much. I was always reading books. Nowadays, of course, most parents go like, oh, if only they would read books. And I always wonder, like, it's weird because I used to, and my parents didn't like that either. Probably at the time they would have said, can you please go online and leave the books alone? Of course, <laughs> Um, but so, you know, parents complain because kids don't do what parents want them to do. Nothing has changed, I think, on that level for many, 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 many decades. So uh, on, on those things, I'm very much uh, an optimist. I did a quick interview yesterday about what I do with my kids in terms of, you know, watching over their online time. And my, I think that this is, again, a, a situation where I think abundance, in my view, at least with my kids, uh, touch wood seems to address most sort of the problems. So in my house, the rule is you go online whenever you want, and therefore it has not that special status of wow, man, I want to go online. And therefore, for my kids, it's not a big, big thing. It's not like uh, can we please use the computer? Sure, you can, and you can drink water and you can breathe and and so on, and and it sort of goes away as an issue, unless of course my expectations are very different from from other. Is there a cultural component to that? I mean, what you say reminds me of kind of the discussion of alcohol, where, you know, it's kind of prohibited here in America for youth, and so there tends to be more binge drinking, whereas Europeans the stereotypically, you know, have more access to it, and so they're not as nuts about it. And I, I hear in North America a lot there is concern about the kid who won't, you know, get his face out of the iPhone and doesn't have face-to-face -face social skills. Have you noticed any cultural differences there? I wish I could say yes, because that would really make me feel good as a European, I guess. But no, I think here parents have the same concerns about, uh, you know, I, I regularly do talks to, to like parents or uh, teachers or librarians. Uh, for instance, for some reason, I typically end up in one of those, uh, in front of one of those audiences. And I typically, I regularly have people who are very angry with me who think that what I do is dangerous and that it corrupts um, the youth, to which my the reaction is always that puts me in good company because I think Socrates was accused of doing the same thing. And so I find it always interesting to see how um, educators parent, like because you know the the parent is the f the first most important teacher to a child, and so your approach to um, to your children, I, I wonder how it differs to your approach to your students, and how um, you know yeah f feel free to to explore and use the computer whenever you want like what kind of skills did you give them at an early age so that they could um, you know meaningfully navigate this abundance of information did you did you let them just go to it and just uh, naturally find it or did you you know give them some guidance I don't know how old your children are but my daughter's 12 and it, I find it really fascinating how much she needs to learn <laughs> 
Uh, is that true? Mine are 10 and 12. I have two girls. Uh, and if you ask me about the difference, my first response was going to be, yes, I think if anything, I probably love them a little bit more. Uh, I like my students. I probably love my kids more than I do my students. Um, the, no, I, 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 I'm not a good guidance person. Um, my attitude on these things is, and I, I keep wondering, I probably lead a terribly privileged life, uh, but my attitude on these things keeps being, uh, I'm there both for my kids and my students. On that level, I don't think there's a big difference to support, to, you know, most of the, you know, most importantly, tell them very oftentimes it, it's okay that it doesn't work flawlessly. It doesn't, you know, I have problems too, so don't worry about it. It's part of, of the game. Um, to encourage them and to say, hey, this is great stuff, what you're doing here. And then to make them think about internal contradictions in what they do. Um, like I, I don't like the, uh, oh, this is wrong. It's like it's supposed to be like this type of reaction. I sometimes do that too, but I always think when I do that, that I'm as an educator or a parent, I'm being lazy. What I really try to do much more is, oh, that's interesting. If you think about this in that way, or if you think that this is true, then how come so and so? Or what does that mean in that context? And so that they can explore it themselves rather than I tell them, hey, the answer is 42. Have you ever seen them, well, the answer is 42, we know that, but have you ever seen them, um, like my daughter will do a, a Google search, and the first hit is the sponsored link, and she goes there? I mean, it drives me crazy. <laughs> what, do you do anything, like what kind of advice do you give to your children about, you know, proper ser searching? Yeah, so I don't do any advice like that, like, oh, don't click on that. Uh, I have, not re recently, maybe I should check again. Uh, I haven't, but uh, before I have, uh, I think they're already at the same level as I am. I'm a little bit blind to these sponsored things. I sometimes wonder, are they still there? Well, yeah, they are. I just don't see them, quote, unquote. And I think they have the same, uh, you know, the same sort of uh, reaction to them. I don't, uh, my daughters regularly do, you know, I guess they do that in most countries at that age, right? They regularly do talks for their um, fellow students and the teacher at school, right? And so that's typically what we end up preparing. I remember doing one a few months ago around uh, Martin Luther King with my daughter. And so, for instance, she then figures out, uh, you know, I have a dream speech is important, um, but she wasn't able to find a version that had Dutch uh, captions, subtitles. And, of course, her English is not... You know, she can't. She doesn't really. She gets the "I have a dream" part, but a lot of the other parts, you know, were not accessible to her. And so, I I think they're pretty good, as far as I know. Um, I think they're pretty good at realizing, you know, the limits of their skills or their knowledge. It, it comes back to what we were discussing a little bit earlier. And so sometimes they come then to me and say, "Look, you know, there's this video thing. I want a version with Dutch subtitles. Where do I find that?" And I go, oh, I don't know, but let's go find it. And so then I help them. But it's typically them with a pretty precise, you know, oh, I need a picture of like, like the one we had over the weekend. I, I need a picture of a, a garment that the Romans used to wear. And when I enter it in Google and I click on this um, pictures only uh, link, I don't find it. What do I do now? And so then together we, 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 we sit behind the screen for 10, 15 minutes. And so. So you, you do it with them, not yes. for them. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Carol, I believe you were going to jump in about 10 minutes ago. Did you have a question you wanted to get in here? Well, I kind of had a question. Um, in, in the era of abundance and that we have so much um, that we can play with, I was wondering what you enjoy playing with the most. What oh, makes you the happiest? What's the most fun for you? Oh, that's a very interesting uh, question. I'm not very well prepared for that because also I should to explain I have this slogan that I often use with my, my students as well as with my kids of serious fun. For me, fun and serious are not opposites. They're like, you know, when it's very serious, it's very often very much fun as well and, and uh, you know, the other way around. And maybe to... Yeah, to, I agree. To different facets to that so I definitely terribly enjoy most of my work I'm one of these lucky people who think like it's crazy don't tell anyone here in the office but it's crazy that they pay me to do this sort of thing because I would you know I would almost pay to be allowed to do it um, so so that's part of my fun the other part the other thing that's a big part of me is, is um, 
um, uh, that's a bit different. Though on the other hand, maybe not. Is uh, is music. Um, so I'm 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 extremely fascinated. I'm a complete amateur. My kids play music. I don't. Uh, my eldest daughter sings in the opera choir, so we go to the opera quite regularly. Sometimes to see her, sometimes uh, just to uh, listen to other stuff. And I think there's something very magical about the moment I like most in music performances is the moment, like like the last half second before the music starts. I very much like this, and it's a little bit maybe anti-technology almost. I never thought about it in those terms, but I very much like this moment when in the opera house, at least in Antwerp, there's maybe, I don't know, 750, 800 people, something like that. And you know that they've all had to arrange babysitters, leave work early, do all sorts of other things to be there at that moment. Then they are still chatting a little bit and the lights go, you know, lower, they lower the lights, if that is English, I'm not sure, so it becomes less intense. And the, the conversation dies out. And then there is this moment when the music hasn't started yet, but it's completely silent. And everybody's like focused on, okay, they're going to start now. And I, I saw that makes, you know, that's even before any note sounds, that makes the hair in my, my neck sometimes stand up of, wow, this is so great. All these people getting together for that purpose. And I also like very much, and then I'll stop about this because otherwise I'll go on for the next two hours about this. I also very much like the, the, the live performance part, the part that you cannot reproduce. It's great to have a recording, right? And I, I listen to many recordings and I watch them as well. But there's something really interesting. It's almost a little bit like this conversation once here right now with just us that has a, a quality that intrigues me. Nice. I love when, your idea of the serious play. It's, it's not really a juxtaposition. It's a wonderful way of learning. And I agree with you about that moment just before something is about to happen, especially in theater and in music. It's, it's an incredible feeling that you really can't quite explain. And Julia, go right ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to connect that because just, just last night, a really good friend of mine, she teaches at, at the college here, and she was watching one of the TED Talks about with the, um, the conductor, and he was talking about the, the art of knowing when to pull people in in an orchestra, and she said it was just like teaching for her. And I, I the way she said it, like I, I got that feeling too, because she was talking about you know, you know, calming the cl the crowd, getting everybody together, and then orchestrating them in at, at the right moment. I thought it was such a beautiful metaphor. I have to go find that TED talk and <laughs> make the connection. I'll think of you, Eric. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, there's a colleague of mine, Pierre Dilambour, at the Polytechnic in Lausanne, who's a big name in computer support of collaborative learn, uh, and he talks about orchestration. Uh, which of course has a connotation with the orchestra as being the main activity of the teacher facilitator. Uh, um, yeah. I have a question if you wouldn't mind me jumping in and I apologize there's no video but I have no access to it at work and the question I have is based on my past experience because I've worked in non-governmental organizations in Europe and I've lived overseas in developing countries and I think the thing that's, that I'm at t tension with is that you speak of this abundance that appears to be causing an even greater divide in society and I know you had mentioned, Eric, before that uh, we were speaking of this abundance in relation to those people who didn't have to worry about where to sleep, what to eat and didn't have those concerns. But we have people in society who are worrying about where to eat and sleep and then we also have those that don't worry about it but we have this thing of media literacy where they're they're lacking in it, where they don't have that access to technology because it's still too expensive, or they just don't have the tools. What responsibilities do we, as people living in this society of abundance, have in terms of having to bridge that gap to make sure that all have equal or at least some access to this abundance? Yeah, I, I, so of course I think we have some responsibility, but I also want to be a, a bit cautious about how to respond to that because um, how would I, it's too easy, I think, to say, yes, we all have a, a big responsibility and please go out and make sure that everybody can, um, you know, has the literacies, um, also has the technical affordances and everything else that he or she needs to, to be part of this game. Um, 
because if we would take that really, really seriously, then surely this would be the end of this conversation, right? And we need to go out now and do it. And, and, and so um, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I don't know, I find that a, a rather complex topic. And I, don't, I just don't want to, to utter a few slogans and be the, the nice guy with the heart in the right place and we can all move on and, and ignore it for the rest. Um, so what can we do in practice? Well, first of all, I do think that this abundance is spreading. Talking about the digital divide in terms of, you know, even within like my little corner of the world, um, you know, one way to talk about it is, you know, my mother is on email now. Um, she's an 80 plus year old and uh, enjoys having access now to, I, I'm trying to get her to understand uh, Google Plus so I can share pictures more easily with her. Um, and so, you know, even I think there, there is an argument to be made that that digital divide, I think, is getting smaller or I'm not sure that a smaller divide is much better because if you fall in a small divide, you still hurt, right? Um, so, so that's one part. On the other hand, there's the other part, I think, which is, of course, going to other areas of the world, um, which you can take metaphorically or geographically. Uh, where I, I, I must admit I'm only doing a very small thing. We've uh, shipped some, some laptops to Mali a few weeks ago because we have family relatives there. And uh, in fact, I think that there was some stuff on my blog about what to put on such laptops and how can we follow up what they then do with it and how much connectivity is there. So um, that I, I much rather have that, how would I say, I much more feel comfortable doing that very small scale i'll work with my mother i'll work with you know relatives of my my partner in, in mali uh, than to do the big slogan uh thing thing and I, I i think it's fine frankly although this you know will probably not be completely agreeable to everybody but i think it's fine that some people make a decision to say look you know you know what i'm going to worry about advancing the technology and I'm going to leave bridging the digital divide to someone else. Um, at least if you're clear with yourself why you do make that choice uh, and the fact that you made that choice, uh, I don't necessarily have a very big problem with that. Um, I'm also, by the way, fine with people, of course, who would say, no, I'll focus on the divide and I don't want to be involved in progressing the technology. That's fine too. Did you have oh, any thoughts good. on that? Uh, I'm sorry, is it Valerie or Vanessa? Uh, it's always one of those that's been very difficult and like you Eric I've also sent laptops overseas and it, of course it's one thing to send and I think it's just keeping that in the back of our mind and I think you you said it right about saying it's okay to advance technology and leave the bridging to someone else we obviously have to find what is our strengths and a little bit again playing back into the past topics of the past weeks that's where I think it all starts to bridges in. You you find that strength, and you, it's okay to to go in one direction because other people will go the other way. We don't all have to be running, like you know, the bulls down in Spain. We don't have to run down the same street. I was just reading a post yesterday where that that whole disparity issue was re really resonating with somebody, and I think we have a lot of colonial guilt. <laughs> it's like we're so privileged. We have so much. But at the same time, we wouldn't even know about the disparity if it wasn't for this abundance of information. That was my main thing. And look at how much longer people are living because we know to wash our hands, we know to keep the animals up. Like there's so much information that we've been able to share and it's just a matter of, of getting it globally. I mean, I think it's better now than it's ever been. It, it, it couldn't, I mean, it used to be worse in my opinion. So. I don't know how we make that practical other than sending laptops. I think, I don't know, I'm not really a hardware person. I think we should be digging wells personally. Uh, speaking of which, Vance had asked a question about whether abundance refers to uh, devices or content. Yeah, and my answer would be uh, definitely both and more than that. Uh, I tried to elaborate a little bit. I need to really elaborate on that some other time. Um, 
invite me back to to to, to elaborate on it uh, some other time. But you know, I, I made a point of you know, it's about devices being connected to networks. It's about information, which is not just resources, but definitely resources as well. It's also about being connected to one another. And I agree with um, I need to put my marker there with Julia about you know at least we now more connected to other people. So I think that may lead to you know. Uh, addressing the digital divide in a better way because I actually know and now communicate with people who live across the digital divide and I think most of us are like that if it, if it becomes personal uh, it's much harder to ignore it right and um, if people are dying of hunger but it's far away and they don't show it between commercials on television you can sort of ignore it but if you know them and they contact you and say hey we're dying of hunger it's a bit more difficult to just shake it off and go, yeah okay uh, it's interesting to know. I'll move on now. Um, and then uh, finally, also something we haven't mentioned that much, and I think it will also be a big thing in addressing the digital divide in terms of uh, literacies, is uh, more connections with uh, devices, right? Uh, like, you know, my father-in-law is uh, very much connected, but he understands nothing at all, not even of the internet, let alone the web or, or, or you know, more advanced things. Um, but he wears a device because he, he has heart problems, basically. So he's connected to the medical facilities 24-7. The only thing he knows is I have this little box here inside actually his, his body, so it's an implant. Um, and whenever something happens, something technical goes on and then people will come rescue me. Um, I did want to get around to the challenge. Examples you find inspiring about how teachers or students leverage abundance of learning. Uh, what has come across your plate this week or prior? that caught your attention? Yeah, so not so many things. So uh, prior, I can say, I, I'm very big, as you you know, about on the openness thing. And so I, I think I also mentioned last week in the, or last Monday, it's on Monday, right? Um, in, the, in the conversation we had um, that uh, I want to, I, I worry sometimes that I'm, you know, for lack of a better term, that I'm al almost like an openness fundamentalist. And I guess fundamentalism, it's, it's probably you know never a good thing. So I want to better understand where some of the limits are uh, to openness. And the only so far, but it wasn't this week. It's been quite a few weeks ago. Um, someone mentioned something that, for me, yeah, that makes me see a certain danger that I don't know very well how you best cope with it. Um, it's a very practical example. Um, it was after a talk I did. A lady came to me and said, "Look." Um, you know, I, in principle, and if you live in a nice part of the world, I guess this openness is all great and stuff. Um, but let me share a, a bit of my personal history. Um, I'm being stalked by my ex. I'm a, I guess stalked is a word that you use in English, right? It's probably an English word mm -hmm. that we borrow from you, right? So yes. is, that, is that a term you know, you know, stalking? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this woman comes to me, uh, this lady comes to me and says, uh, uh, so here's my problem. I'm being stalked by my ex. I don't feel very comfortable having my whereabouts being completely open on, you know, social networks. I'm not very comfortable about him knowing even the people I communicate with because our situation is such that he will then go harass these people. So let's assume that I'm being stalked by my ex. I'm not, don't worry. And, and I guess in that case, it would be a she. She would find out, you know, who you are. And then tomorrow you would receive all sorts of messages about me. It's just going to be a moment where I think, like, I don't want to have to deal with this. I'm going to have this conversation in private with you, and please don't post it on the whatever open platform it is, uh, because I don't want, you know, you guys then to suffer from the consequences of my personal situation. And yes, you can say that in principle the real problem is how, you know, this person's psychology, if you want, but you can't just abstract away from the fact that this person has a very real concern and a very practical reason why she felt this openness thing is not going to work very well for me or at least I'm not very comfortable launching myself into it. So that's so far the only real example where I went like, yeah, I'm not sure how I would deal with that. Maybe that would be the end of Eric the open guy. And uh, Yeah, I'm not I'm, sure how inspiring that is. Say again? I'm not sure how inspiring that is. We were looking for inspiring examples. I don't feel inspired. Oh, no, 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 no. This was my other, this, I'm sorry. This was my other challenge, right? I wanted people uh -huh. to both be inspiring examples and also to help me figure out where the limits are and where the mm -hmm. fundamentalism may be playing and so that I would see, hmm, I need to, you know, 
figure out a little bit better how this uh, is structured. No, in terms of inspiring examples, uh, I'm sure you guys have some. Maybe we should open the floor up for, we've got a, a, a hangout full of open practitioners. Jose, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, what you do. I'm sure you have some examples on uh, in the works. Uh, me? Yes, you. Oh, you mean examples of uh, using... Teachers doing good things with all this abundance. Well, I mean, uh, in the Masters of E-Learning Pedagogy that we have at uh, the Portuguese Open University, we try to work as much as we can out in the open, uh, at least in most of our courses. So we, we try our students to publish their works online so that they can have feedback and, and interact with people from their own personal networks, their colleagues or people they know. Uh, we try to, to embed their practice in, in the masters uh, and their learning in the masters in their professional lives and their in their day-to-day -day lives. So we have this concern to open up learning, even in a formal education context as we have, to open it up and try to bring it in what is the real life of people and not, not make it a separate part of their lives that goes on in a world garden that no one else other than their teachers or, or, or colleagues can see. Um, I don't know if that's inspiring or not. I mean, if this is a very general thing that I think many of us do. So, uh... And I see that Vance has an example. I just have to say, Jose, that I think your background is the most inspiring of the Hangout. It's like a nice background of media that almost looks like a piece of modern art itself. It's that's, nice. that's just my CDs I have there. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of them. <laughs> Professor Stevens. Yeah, um, I just moved into a new apartment. It's my background, it's blank wall. <laughs> Pictures aren't up yet. Uh, I think I could just pan the camera later. But anyway, no, I, you're looking for examples. I, 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 I heard a really good one. I've got an hour long com commute, and I try to listen to podcasts on this commute, so I learn a lot during the commute. But there was a really nice example. Um, as somebody uh, was talking about how they're uh, with Google Docs, their kids are using Google Docs to write, and one of the kids, the parent said one of the kids was sharing the writing assignments in the class with him. So in other words, the kid is including his parents to get feedback on his writing. Isn't that cool? I mean, that's a, there, there's something that abundance that just sort of fell on people, and all of a sudden it's bringing, Eric would like that because he, he has time for his kids, and uh, so you can sort of mix uh, your work and your, you know, the, the things that you really like uh, with what the kids are doing. If you leave it to me, I'm always going to bring it right back to DS106. <laughs> My favorite example of openness. I mean, it, um, the aggregated blog, the WordPress blog, allows you to have a built-in community. So I, my first post that I had ever, uh, ever done, I just put a picture up. And then immediately I got all these comments from people within the community who were like, how did you do that? Why did you do that? How did, what was your process? Tell me more about it. Why, you know, ask, prompting me to, to answer these questions. So then I started writing the context around it. And then I started um, blogging more frequently because I, was get, I, I actually had people who were listening to me. And then I would go visit their sites and they would inspire me. And so it was doing all of this learning out in the open, it, it like uncorked a whole array of creativity in me. I mean, the whole Dave Cormier rhizomatic drawing was, I, you know, if I drew it back and traced my, um, did an audit of my learning, it would have gone right back to DS-106. So I can't, I can't possibly, um, it's the answer to everything, if you ask me. Uh, speaking of D <laughs> DS-106, anything you'd like to plug, Carol? Well, yes. Uh, Jim Groom of DS-106 will be our uh, amazing guest today on CMC 11 at uh, noon, New York time. Um, I'm really looking forward to the session with him. We've had uh, a lot of fun. I haven't done as much in DS-106 as Julia has because I got sidetracked into a whole lot of other work. But I have followed what Julia has done and what a lot of other people have done. Um, so it's going to be exciting. 
I've been trying I to integrate it into one? Change 11. That's awesome, Carol. You should just uh, do one animated GIF. <laughs> well, I, I, have done them. I have done them before. But next next semester, I plan on devoting a lot of time to DS-106. Um, one of the things that I did want to say to the aspect of the openness, I get a little bit confused. And I'm fairly certain that I'm older than anybody here. But um, my my education career was one of openness. Now, part of that has to do with my personality and the fact that I rebelled against anything that was closed. It also has to do with the various uh, fields that I was involved in, and they were pretty much creative. And so when you're in a creative field, you do tend to collaborate, to connect, and to exchange. Um, so sometimes I get a little puzzled about this. And the one thing I'm having trouble with now is um, now that I've come back to what I find is a wonderful learning opportunity in the openness and the open education resources, I am not sure what other countries face this, but in the United States we have a little thing called FERPA, which is the government uh, overseeing or telling the schools that the students, everything they do has to remain private. Uh, from everybody. I think sometimes from themselves it has to remain private. And so there's a little bit of a dichotomy there. How can you be open and have Big Brother FERPA looking over your shoulder? It's, it's a tough line to walk. Um, and I'm not walk, walking it. I'm just I'm being as open as I can and letting people know if they have things they don't want known, then please don't participate in that way. Only put out there what you are comfortable having out there. But I wonder if anybody else ever has any problems with that. It's almost a three-hour show in itself. Yeah, And, and the <laughs> clock is ticking, and we need to let Eric uh, move on, unfortunately, to the Illuminate. Yeah. Uh, but I want to check in with Brenda. I believe you have something to share. Oh, Brenda has frozen for me. Well, Brenda, if you we're not hearing you, if uh, maybe because you're still muted. Yep. In the meantime, I'll chat until we get that. Please oh, do. She's gonna, okay, I was just going to say, Carol, um, you you can get Jim to rant about FERPA all. <laughs> if you, you even bring that rant up about pretty much anything can't you <laughs> yeah. well there's a lot of discussion going on with the whole FERPA thing so I've been reading and following I mean in Ontario we have a different uh, set of laws but they're pretty much the same and uh, you know it's called FIPA here but it's the same sort of thing but, but, uh, maybe a quick uh, reaction to that uh, we don't have uh, I can pretend at least to not know about it uh, we don't have any legal problems like that in, in Belgium uh, though I'm sure someone will uh, let me know tomorrow that we do um, um, but I just, I guess, ignore them. I think I made a point earlier in my, my other talk uh, that I, my attitude tends to be to ask for forgiveness rather than permission, right? Um, but I do spend time uh, with my students uh, at the start of, uh, you know, uh, my courses um, to explain to them why we do things in the open and why we use the tools we use and what the potential, you know, uh, effects can be in as far as I can predict them at all um, and I can certainly tell you forget about the legal stuff but uh, probably about one third of the class um, and of the students feel at the beginning very uncomfortable about this and, um, and think that it's inappropriate uh, a big worry that my students at least have is that they will it's interesting interesting that they find that even a problem they, they fear that it will make them so engaged that they will neglect their other courses and uh, will no longer have a real life because they will be so active in the course. And I always think like, is that a, a compliment or is that a, a danger or, or rather an opportunity? But anyway, I do have that conversation with them. I do try to make them feel a, a little bit comfortable about it. And then at some point I also tell them, um, look, you know, you don't have to take this course. Um, it's perfectly fine if you say, this is not what I want to do. Um, go do something else. So um, Belgium and perhaps Europe don't have these restrictive laws and chaos has not broken out? Uh, I, I guess the frank answer would be, I don't want to know. 
<laughs> Good answer. Um, and we probably should let you go because you need to uh, transition to the Blackboard Collaborate. Uh, but before we let you go, any final words or comments? And, and Brenda, I'm very sorry we're not uh, getting you in, but we'll uh, troubleshoot next time. And to answer Vance's question, uh, there is, not to my knowledge, a feed of all the Change 11 podcasts or media. Illuminate recordings have been hit or miss. Uh, when I stay up late enough to record it, I toss it up onto archive. But um, one of the limits to abundance is someone to record and post. And that doesn't <laughs> seem to be totally uh, coordinated yet. Speaking of open, I really appreciate you uh, translating that into other formats that I can put on my phone and walk around and do other things and listen to. It's been really helpful. Keep up the good work, Jeff. You're my hero. Yay, open yeah. media. And you are my yeah, new thanks, hero. Jeff. What a great session yeah. this has been. And, and if anybody is not tired of MOOCs by the time uh, Eric is finished, just roll on over to uh, CMC11 and listen to Jim Groom rant on DS106. <laughs> Where is that? Do you have the URL that you can share that? Ah, uh, can you just Google CMC11 because it's one of those long blog spot, uh, WordPress blog things. I will toss Sorry. it in here shortly. Uh, Eric, thank you very much for uh, taking some time to hang out with us. And uh, you're welcome anytime. We meet uh, pretty much once a week. Times vary a little bit. Speaking of which, I'm going to try and have an Australia-friendly time next week, some of the Folks down under have said, oh, man, it's 2 a.m., uh, so we'll go earlier or later sometime. Stay tuned to the media sphere for information about that. So thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for Thank having you. me, thanks, and Jeff. I have to warn you, I'll be back. Excellent. We'll look forward <laughs> to it. That's a promise, Thank I hope. Thank you, Eric. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye, thanks. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.